Okay, I'll start by saying why I picked uh, Tonda Digifoni. That's actually one of the standard uh, European hazel. It actually means round one from Gifoni. It's like the roundest of the European hazels. And uh, it's a quite high quality, quite high ha quality hazel actually. So how many of you were here earlier for the last? Okay, so I'll be quick on this part. That's what Oregon looks like. This is what wild American hazelnut looks like. Yeah, it's quite different. Uh, essentially, we're looking for these hazelnuts uh, across Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota. And this is essentially a large project. This is the American hazelnut side of it. There's quite a bit of work been done with the hybrids. That's not really the side that I'm involved in. I'm involved with the, uh, the pure American. And because so much of this comes out of Turkey, this is actually a potential uh, economic opportunity for the US. Midwest industry is relatively new. Uh, it's basically all interspecific hybrids right now, and they're all seed origin plantings, meaning there's a lot of genetic variability. High yields across the lake states, relatively speaking, potentially uh, quite good compared to soybean for oil. So a photo from Mark Shepard. This is what one of the uh, higher productivity hybrids looks like. You can see basically nearly as many leaves as hazelnuts on there. It's just an amazingly high yield plant. So our American hazelnut is native to Wisconsin, uh, grows on a wide range of soils, and we have millions of plants to choose from. And so that's pretty much everything from the last slideshow for those that saw it. Um, that's what we're looking at. So the objective of this is a pretty simple one. And it actually started with a comment at one of the grower meetings. We had a grower meeting that's it's probably been four years or more ago now. And one of them actually was a specialty coffee roaster as his primary industry or business. And he was basically saying, well, you're really going to have to concentrate on the flavor. Don't worry about yield. Yield is something different. You need to make sure these things taste good. Now, I mean, I've been eating wild hazelnuts for an awfully long time. I don't think any of them taste bad. But so what I said, OK, we'll actually look at this. And essentially, the objective was to assess the flavor and processing characteristics of a, some selected American hazelnut. And we wanted to compare it to something that would be a European standard. So we had something for comparison. So we just picked the best European standard, Tonda Digifoni, the roundest one, very high quality. So selection criteria on this. The individuals we picked, we needed a lot of hazelnuts to be able to do this. So we couldn't pick individual plants that were low yielding. We needed to be able to get a bunch of them in order to actually do the analysis. So what we did is we picked individual wild plants, which were basically dragging the ground with hazelnuts. So by default, these are already high yielding plants, uh, just simply because we needed enough to do it. These things were processed. They were processed in a barrel husker. They basically uh, were processed and then stored in onion bags. And then they were cracked with a drill cracker. And so basically the approach that's been used more or less with most of the uh, uh, hybrids. They're then roasted at 165 degrees C for 10 minutes, stirred every two minutes, and that's what we got. So if you look at these little guys, um, this is Tonda Gigifoni up on the uh, upper part, I guess on your side, on the upper left of the screen. And what's the one thing that stands out to you when you look at those? A lot bigger. Also more consistent. That's actually another characteristic. It's pretty important. Now we had heard. That's another thing. The pellicle is completely covering those. Compare that to the American hazelnut. Some of these have already basically removed their pellicle almost completely, just simply because of the uh, process of basically uh, shelling them. So there are some distinct differences between them. And we'll talk about some of the other characteristics here in a little bit. So we'll start with the physical properties. <clears throat> the ability to use these things for the chefs we heard about just before, that's one class of market use. But if you're actually going to use this at a, a higher level with a more mass market approach to it, you're going to need something that consistently can go through a, a roaster. It needs to be fairly round. The closer to a ball bearing you get, the better. Uh, so round, there are other characteristics like individual weight of the nuts and density that are pretty important. So we did random draw of five nuts. We measured each of the five nuts out of each one of the classes, did the weights and the measurements. So if you look at a hazelnut, this is the characteristics we looked at. Essentially, you look at height, thickness, and then width. So when you hear me saying width, I'm talking across the seam. When you hear me saying thickness, I'm talking perpendicular to the seam. And length is from the bottom up to the top of the nut. 
So we get the geometric diameter of these things and the sphericity. The sphericity is actually an index around this. So the closer you get to 1.000, the closer to ball bearingness you get. Anything that's off of 1.00 indicates it's, it's oblong in some way or shape. And then we also did taste testing. So we actually ran this through uh, NC State, who has a, patina, a peanut test tasting lab down there. And we use them because, I mean, they test bazillions of samples, basically, of nuts. So these people are extremely well trained in the spectrum method. Each one of the testers we used had several hundred hours of testing experience. So they've done this for quite an extended period of time. And they basically are test on looking at individual flavors and doing comparisons of those flavors to other standards. And so the universal intensity scale was set 0 to 15. 15 was maximum intensity. 0 is basically no intensity. And we used the uh, literature that we uh, basically had done on this literature review to come up with the flavor lexicon. So we knew what actually flavor components were of interest. And that allowed us to do comparison to these other researchers. So if I want to look at someone who's worked on an Iranian variety, for example, I can actually compare what they got for results against what my American hazels are, which is why it's set up like that. So analysis, standard statistical analysis. We did analysis of variance in Tukey's uh, using one program, we did correlation mar uh, matrices, cluster analysis, and dendrograms using Minitab. And with the cluster analysis, we eliminated a couple of factors. One of them, caramel-like, and another, uh, painy and rancid, because they weren't detected, there was no purpose in keeping them in the model, because zero is zero. And then over-roast and under-roast is processing issues. We removed that also from the analysis. So here's what we found to start with. You don't even need to do a test to figure this one out. Giffoni's way bigger. <laughs> and it's actually like four times as big. It's a quite sizable nut compared to this. So if I was actually going to set this down on a table and I'm dealing with a general American consumer, that's actually important as a visual. For whatever reason, people in this country, if there's a big nut there and a little nut, they're going to grab the big one. So for nuts on the table, that's an important, important component. How many people actually eat them that way as composed to in other products like uh, Nutella is an example or in candy bars? Actually, in candy bars, a smaller nut size would be better. In trail mixes, a smaller nut size would be better. Um, so sphericity was similar. Essentially, these things, uh, the roundest one of the European ones, Tonda de Giffoni, is actually about as round as our American hazelnuts are. So for running them through a commercial rotisserie, that's actually a good thing. And the density is the interesting part. American hazelnut's more dense. And I had no clue why that would be, because you know, when you actually look on a, a per cubic centimeter basis, it doesn't seem like it should be. I think it may be in part due to the fact that if you look at the inside of one of these Giffonis, there's actually an air pocket that is very, very small inside an American hazelnut. However, when I compared that actually to uh, European hazelnuts, what I found out is Giffoni's the oddball. Actually, Giffoni has a lower density than most of the other nuts. So I have always said I would never put a slide up like this. <laughs> <laughs> However, I am for a very specific reason, and I'm not sure if I've got a little laser on this thing or not. Right at the top here. Oh. If you look right here, this is basically your mass. These are significantly bigger. Most of the American hazels within a relatively tight size range, but it's basically a quarter of the size of the European. Sphericity, 0.97 is pretty much very little bit shy of a round ball bearing. But if you look at some of these, I actually have some of the American hazelnuts that are either comparable or actually rounder than the European one. This was one concern about these, is they wouldn't be round enough to be effectively run through a rotisserie and roasted appropriately. The density is the other thing. Pretty consistently lower than, you know, not just than some, but literally than every other one of these. So looking at taste, this is actually even more, com more important characteristic. Um, several of them are quite similar to Giffoni. Giffoni is one of the best European varieties that's out there. And wild selected American hazelnut, we have several individuals that are actually comparable in quality to the best European quality. That's actually pretty cool when you think about it. Uh, the aroma intensity on many of these, as well as the nutty flavor, is actually better in the American hazelnut than the European hazelnut. So we actually have better parameters for those qualities. 
we do have higher bitterness. Um, where is she? Right here. That's actually something that your chefs noted with the hybrids. Now these are straight American, but I would assume it's the same in there. There's a higher bitterness in these than in Jafoni, and there's also a detectable soapy cleaner flavor in some. Others didn't have it. I'm not sure what that's due to, but if I had to guess, I would say that's actually a post-harvest handling issue because as these fatty acids are in storage, they have a tendency to deteriorate if not stored appropriately, and a hanging onion bag in a greenhouse is a non-ideal way to store them. So we did cluster analysis, and basically when we did this, it takes all those parameters on these hazelnuts and actually tries to make mathematical clusters that says who seems like who else. And so when we look at this, Jafoni is different, but we have a group of these that are quite comparable to Jafoni. So essentially five that cluster with Jafoni and then a group that cluster differently. So what that's essentially saying is we have a, a group of these hazelnuts that have characteristics, with the exception of size, that are extremely close to how Jafoni is. And when we look at that, the funny thing about it is, start with aroma intensity. Jafoni's in cluster two. So if I look at aroma intensity, 420 over here, 3.61, actually the ones that cluster with Jafoni aren't as good. They have less aroma. Go down here to, uh, oh, what was the one of the other ones here? Do, 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 do. Bitterness, lower bitterness, which is good. Less nutty flavor, which is bad. Then more soapy cleaner, which is bad. So if I look at this, if I take it as a whole, to me it actually means that we have just out of these wild selections, really high quality ones for processing. Jafoni is definitely bigger. That is a barrier in some markets, not in others. Uh, Sphericity is comparable. Essentially, um, they're both round like little ball bearings. And uh, when you look at published varieties, it turns out that if you go across the international varieties, Jafoni is actually the oddball for roundness. A lot of the European ones are a lot less round, meaning that our average American hazel beats most of the European hazel for processing efficiency for its ability to run through the rotisseries. Density is higher, but interesting. It means that Jafoni is the oddball, not our hazels or the regular European. For some reason, it's a lighter density hazelnut. I don't know why that is, but ours are comparable to the published varieties. <clears throat> Bitterness is a potential defect, but this is actually a kind of funny thing because anybody ever heard the bitterest medicines are the best? Anybody ever heard that statement? It's actually something to that. Much of this bitterness, the things that are actually perceived as astringency or bitterness, bitterness is these little short, short chain polyphenolics and astringency is a little bit longer chain polyphenolics. Those things actually are, impact your body they're in a positive way. You probably have heard about other ones that get into your body. They basically are uh, free radical scavengers. They basically deal with uh, negative health impacts. If we eliminate bitterness, we may actually be eliminating some of the health promoting factors of these nuts. However, most of that bitterness is also in the pellicle. So if we were to do, for example, what you're talking about, which is basically steam blanch and peel, most of that bitterness probably disappears. At this point, I wish we'd actually done the taste test on non-peeled as well as peeled nuts, but I, <laughs> I didn't need twice as many nuts, and hazelnuts don't make enough to do that work. Uh, the soapy cleaner flavor is... Uh, Relatively low, but it's probably due to post-harvest handling. That's actually something that needs to be uh, paid attention to as far as if our post-harvest handling actually damages some of the flavor characteristics of the nuts. And so I want to point this out because I think some of these really jump out here. How round is that darn thing? That's like a ball bearing. How about this one? This is Jafoni. Jafoni looks round, but it's interesting is it's kind of bumpy. It's round when you, I'm oh, five minutes, okay. It's uh, bumpy on the outside. If I actually look at these, many if not all of these are probably superior to the Euro best European variety for processing, which I think is really cool. So final conclusions, they taste good. Um, as good or better than European standard variety. Um, they are little ball bearings, phenomenal for running through a rotisserie. Uh, they are different in flavor from the European. I don't see that as necessarily a bad characteristic because that actually def makes a, a niche market 
potential for them. And the last is they're definitely smaller than nuts. I don't think we can actually increase the nut size uh, effectively through breeding. So if I was to actually decide on that one, I would say we just don't even need to pay attention to it. We have to decide they're smaller and go with it. And that is where I'm going to leave this one. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So you looked at spirits of the kernels. Kernels. I did not pay any attention at all to the in, the in shell. shell because basically one, most of these nuts will probably be used as an out of shell. Right. Yeah. But spirit of the in shell has an impact, an on, impact on shelling. Yes, shelling. I would imagine it does. Mm -hmm. So um, I've actually measured that and can't say I remember what my results were, but mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd say it's variable. Yep. I would say it may be variable out of it. These actually all processed relatively efficiently. Um, we just ran them through that. Uh, the cracker we ran them through did a really good job. As you can see, looking at them, they're yeah, nice and I clean. You sized them first, though, did you? Actually, they weren't sized first. They were run through as they were run through. The sizing, I'm sure, would assist it greatly, because that's one problem we do run into with these, is that if you have small ones and big ones, when they run through that cracker, you end up with ones not cracked that have to be hand-picked out and run back through. And that's an incredible inconvenience. So they should have been sized first, but we're dealing with nuts off of one, one hazelnut bush for each one of these samples, and there's kind of a lot of variability. Yeah. Can you speculate on the pulse harvest handling is just getting hot and, and, and variability in temperature is probably part of it also because these things are going to be uh, run through a husker and then the juices from the husk are actually going to be sitting on the nuts i wouldn't be surprised if that has some impact um, post harvest handling conditions are just there's a lot of research out there i mean people do their entire careers on how to post harvest handle things to end up with a better endpoint so i guess what i would say is that's one of those things that I'm going to let someone More else. Research. Well, that's someone else's expertise, not mine, there basically. <clears throat> but they're actually, this after ripening alters a lot of the esters and stuff that form. So a lot of the scent parameters that people perceive are actually quite significantly altered by how you store it. And I don't know, having harvested these things myself, there's so much variability that ends up happening in just what I do because it depends on what I have to do that evening and two days later as to when things actually happen. And it's a non-ideal way, but on, I mean, how many people that are doing this do their whole livelihood off of it? Very few. Most people are doing it as a part of some other business. So do you know in the history of the handling of the component? <coughs> do you know it was handled? Yeah, those were, and we actually got those from a fellow up in Canada. They were actually processed extremely, extremely like they would be done industrially. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you talked uh, at the very beginning about how this might be useful for people doing kind of larger, um, using larger quantities of hazelnuts, yeah. maybe roasting for you know coffees and things like that. But did you get feedback from any of those folks about what they thought about the different flavors? Not at this point, no. We the flavor that we actually what we have gotten from it was out of uh, NC State as far as their flavor lab, but as to whether this is a desirable or non-desirable thing. We haven't asked anyone. Oh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. So of the varieties that you all found to be promising, do they normally come true to seed oftentimes in terms of a variety? No. <laughs> That's roughly on the category of apples in coming true to seed, I would assume. Okay, yeah. so if you have one that has those good characteristics, there's probably the Vegetative propagation. That, and okay. yeah, some form of vegetative propagation. Okay. And actually, if you're interested, I got a poster in there okay. that kind of talks about that. Yeah, so it yeah. basically will be a cultivar. Then. It pretty much would. The approach right now that they're using is seed origin. And is there is some logic that if you actually will go through the basically enough bot genetic bottlenecks, you may actually get relatively true to seed. Mm -hmm. However, I don't have that time. I'm going to only be retiring in 17 years, so I got to push things a little faster than that. <laughs> And so as a consequence, um, we're looking more at vegetative propagation, just simply because once you do have the good individuals, there's a lot of sense to the consistency of rows with the same type. Yeah. 
there's some negatives associated with it. It's not a perfect system. There are negatives associated with having entire fields of russet Burbank potatoes, for example. Mm -hmm. There's also some significant processing benefits of having exactly the same individual. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. Good.